Hi, Julie. Let me just pop you in. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Okay, she's connecting. There she is. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. I'm great. Good to see you too, as always. How, how have you been? I've been good. Um, yeah? This is good because it's given me an opportunity to kind of get more organized with a lot of my images and <laughs> look at my Mongolia images, which I didn't have so much time to work on. And yeah, it's been great. They're beautiful. Well, for everybody joining, uh, this is the Thinking of Art call series I started really during quarantine. And the purpose of it was really to introduce you to artists and creatives around the world. And um, so I think this is the 20, I think we're on 27 or something. But Julie and I have known each other a long time. We were talking earlier today, been about seven years or so we met. And um, and when I lived on the East Coast, and I fell in love with, with her photography, and so just wanted to introduce you to Julie Testweed. She was an incredible uh, photographer, professional photographer. I'm going to talk about her background a little bit. But in, but, um, in the meantime, I wanted to tell you to go on kipton.com forward slash shop, and the first eight images are uh, incredible shots of wild horses that she has photographed around the world. So first of all, Julie, talk about your background. Like, How did you get started? Okay, so I basically, when I was uh, about 10 years old, I got my first camera, which I'm going to show you right here. Yeah, show us. Um, a little brownie Kodak camera, which I used <laughs> in the neighborhood. Here's the box. Incredible. Which is pretty funny. Oh, um, my God. And I, when I went through um, college, I really, you know, my whole life, I was really into art and photography. And so I studied at University of Wisconsin in Madison. And when I graduated, I ended up um, as a New York City staff photographer for a big corporation that did a lot of sporting events around the country. So it was a lot of experience traveling around to many different locations to photograph um, marathons and golf tournaments. And mm -hmm. so I had a lot of assignments over the years for probably like all the 80s and some of the 90s. And then I had kids and I kind of wanted to um, do more fine artwork because I was always painting and experimenting and doing alternative processes. So for those years I was exhibiting in galleries with using old Polaroid cameras. Um, I'm not really a techie, so I don't really love um, <laughs> complicated equipment. So I try yeah. to keep it simple. And I actually have here my very first camera that was um, a Nikon FM, all manual, where I would have to hand no way. and use a hand you, there, in, shooting how many? How many years ago was that when you got that was that camera? like 1981. Wow. So I went from there to I also did um, here I have to show you my great big other film camera. I love the dark room. So I oh, have oh very sheet, cool. Yeah, sheet film camera that I used to use. Um, but I like things simple. So I had a hard time getting into digital. Um, and so I these are the cameras I use now because a lot of people want to see the equipment. Um, mm -hmm. Very long lens. And yeah. they're Nikon. Everything's Nikon. Um, I don't know if you can see that. But anyway, yeah. we'll keep talking about the equipment because that's just one tool in the whole process. But so what happened was um, I kind of switched gears and I did exhibiting um, in France and um, the Berkshires. And I sold a lot of more of the painterly images. Um, I incorporated encaustic wax probably 20, 25 years ago into my work. Um, and then... Mm -hmm. I, about six years ago, well, we were going to talk a little bit about my passion, my two passions in my life. Um, I yes. Grew up in the West, and um, I was an absolute obsessed with horses and photography. And what happened was um, I finally got uh, my first horse um, well, really about probably 35 years ago for a couple of years. And then we got an Icelandic horse about 12 years ago. And that's what really propelled me into um, you know, loving this breed and, and riding. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I had two very serious accidents that kind of put all of that to rest. And I realized I the second time um, after the first accident, I got back on. But after this last one, six years ago, I just could not um, possibly um, with my back and with all the injuries. So the good news is, um, my passion for horses took me to all of these far off places trying to capture um, images of the animal that I love so much. 
So where was the first location that so, you traveled to? Okay, so I and it wasn't always wild horses. There are some locations where um, that I went to in France. There's a great guy, Tony Stom Stromberg, um, that uh, directed me and helped me in. Um, it was in Toulouse, France, and I got some really cool. Um, let's see if I've got one here. No, I don't have that. Sorry. Anyway. Okay. Um, so I started off, um, you know, just shooting horses in, in France and other locations, but I really had this desire to go and find some wild horses. So that's what took me to Sable Island. And I've taken two trips now to Sable Island and had two extremely different experiences. Um, first of all, it's up in Nova Scotia, off the coast of, yep. Canada, you know, off, off of Halifax. And you fly up there and then you wait each morning at 8 a.m. to find out if the weather is good enough to land. Um, because what you're going to land on is this tiny, you're going to fly in and land on this very one mile wide by 29 miles long wow. island on a tiny plane. And here's the Are you plane. by yourself? Did your, did your husband no, go with you? No, it's a small plane. And I went just with some okay. strangers um, and a guy, okay. security that, that arranged it actually, because you have to get permission from the government of Canada. So he wow. was terrific. And um, the feeling, first of all, I was very afraid being in the small plane because I had been with someone else in a small plane that had ended up having a tragic accident. So I was very afraid being in this little plane. So that was my first hurdle. But then flying in and seeing hundreds and hundreds of horses wandering around this remote island that has no people except a few researchers spend time there. Um, and gray seals are all along the coast. It was just mm -hmm. absolutely breathtaking. And sand dunes, um, and you ended up landing on basically uh, the sandy beach. So that morning they have to check and make sure the beach is not underwater. And so the landing is pretty crazy too, because it's a mile wide and that's what you're landing on. So are you just allowed to stay there for the day or did you yeah, stay so overnight? That's, that's the big bummer is um, you can get special permission, which I'd like to do later um, to stay longer, but there's no, you know, if you get stuck because of weather, then you can actually stay overnight and you're supposed to bring a toothbrush and a few things, um, you know, to sleep over. But wow. you can only stay from, you're there at like 1030 until sunset. And the best times to shoot are in the morning and at night. So, you know, at the end of the day. So it's really frustrating because you're there right in the middle of the day with not the good light. But these horses are just um, long, shaggy manes and... Um, they're just magnificent. You're only supposed to get a, uh, not any closer than 65 feet, but um, they're very friendly and, you know, they don't seem afraid of you. I'm going to turn this around so you can Yeah, see. and show us. Cause... Oh, can I flip it on here? Yeah, I guess I can flip it, right? Yeah, you can flip it. Okay, so that's yeah. Sable Island. So you can Gosh. see how skinny it is. So skinny. the other bummer is you're flying in and you land way over here. And yeah. the horses you've seen are all up here and you can't possibly walk there and back in the same day. Oh, wow. So that's a little bit tricky. Um, how long is the, so it's a mile wide and how long is the island? 27 miles long. Okay. So it's very hard. You could never get down to the other end where, where the horses are. So the first time I went, it didn't matter. There were a lot of horses. Here's one of them. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of babies. Um, this is what they look like. They're much more... Um, kind of mangy with dreadlock. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're really, really cool. Um, here I am shooting. Someone, one of the other people took a picture of me shooting the horses in the dunes. Um, mm -hmm. But also you need to get weighed when you are getting on the plane to make sure you don't have too much weight. So you have to travel as light as possible. So that's a little bit um, tricky too. You have to really make sure you're not taking any more than you need. And it's a lot of hiking and walking through dunes. Yeah. So the trick to finding the horses too is this fresh water pond is where they will go to drink. So right. that's one way to find them. Otherwise you can walk for hours and hours and, you know, just not be able to find them. But Amazing. anyway, a little bit about the, this one uh, was on my second trip. The first trip I went, I saw so much beauty and life and babies. And one of your images that you have of mine lost on Sable Island is there that was looking for its mom. Um, the lost, yeah, that's the very first one, you guys, if you're on kipton.com forward slash shop. Um, that's the little baby that's running off by itself. Talk about that photo. 
So that one um, was was just kind of wandering, looking for its mom. And I have a picture later where it actually joined up with the mom. And it was very, very sweet. Mm -hmm. And when I went back the second time, a different time of year, I was really expecting to see all these babies again. And, um, you know, just kind of a similar type of experience. And I got there, Kipton. It was, it was just absolutely devastating. I got off the plane and I did see one absolutely beautiful horse just walking along on a sandbar. And then the whole entire rest of the seven hours, I only saw four other horses. And I saw four horses that were that had died um, in mm. childbirth. And there was a lot of death and despair. And it was so alarming and so upsetting. And I couldn't get down to see all the horses at the other end. So I ended up documenting, you know, what I did see. And um, it was really shocking. But the, the horse I saw at the beginning of the day, um, I was getting walking to get back on the plane. And I just was so discouraged and wish I had gotten more, you know, beautiful scenes. And then all of a sudden yeah. it happened right here. Oh, that's beautiful. And is that I a baby or is that a, is that a full grown horse? It's can't a full grown tell. horse. They're smaller than, than, um, you know, a lot of horses, but okay. um, unfortunately a lot of them, you know, don't survive um, because the, all they eat is grasses and they eat a lot of sand, mm. which is bad in their teeth. And their feet also, I saw some with very overgrown hooves mm -hmm. and were not like this one right here. I don't know if it would have survived, you know, till the next year. Um, was so, was that in 2017? Was that your first shoot or your second shoot? So this, the first shoot was where all the babies and all the horses, um, here's three of them walking along the beach. Um, see. Yeah. And, and the second one was where all the death and despair. And that was... Um, actually in june so it was after the winter um when i went okay. in october there it was full of life and it was it was just spectacular oh my god so yeah. where did you, so in essence of time we're at 12 13 minutes into the call okay. i want to be be able to get through the other yep. locations, oh, other locations. What's, one more can we go one. to the next next location yes so the next one i'm going to talk about is last fall i went to mongolia yeah because there are the actually truly only wild horses in the entire world. Um, they're non-feral and they were almost extinct. And what happened was um, there was a woman um, that decided to round them. They were mostly just in zoos around the world and around the country. So mm -hmm. she rounded them up and brought them to France and ended up um, helping that, you know, they bred and learned how to live like freely and they delivered them to Hustai Park in um, Mongolia, like, I don't know, maybe 10 years after that or 15 years mm -hmm. after that. And now there's like 500 or let me see how many, I, I get confused with all these places, how many there are now. There's fi about 500 roaming and eating grass all day in these mountains. So talk about this one shot. And you guys, if you're on the site, you'll see it. It's the two, are they two baby, or it's a, are they two full grown horses? There was, one was the mom and one was the full. Okay. And they're ta taki pair, is that how you say that? Mongolian taki? Yeah, they're called Shavalsky. Um, okay. You can't even spell, it starts with the, I can't spell it, it starts with a P, Z. Um, it's, it's, it was a scientist, a Russian scientist um, name. But the taki um, are the ones that are um, the wild horses in, these, in this mountainous area. Mm. And I spent two weeks there and we lived in, um, stayed in yurts um, with, and met nomadic families and learned their way of life. And it, it was so fascinating. Um, it was- uh, How yeah, long were you there? For two weeks. And the, the thing is, is I'm not really a morning person, but I made myself get up at the crack <laughs> of mine, like really in the dark. And there it was freezing yeah. cold. We slept in our, in our coats and I slept in a yeah. down so cold. Um, and there was no running water or heat. So, you know, during the night, you think twice about going out to the outhouse or in the hold in the ground down, <laughs> down the way. Yeah. So early in the morning, we would get up and go. And the other wildlife was just these huge stag were just howling at the top of the mountains next to the horses. So I have these silhouettes that I haven't gotten to yet, but they're just magnificent of these <laughs> giant stag next to the, um, the horses. So anyway, it was, it was um, you know, mostly shooting again in the morning and at night when the wildlife were all like moving around. And, um, mm -hmm. and I got a lot like gazelle running through the fields and 
I had a, a driver that would just drive 100 miles an hour through these rivers and I'm screaming, no, no. <laughs> and he's playing like the Mongolian rap music. Yeah, <laughs> just wild, just wild man. Yeah. And you're like hanging out for dear life. I'm like, I don't want to swim through this river, you know, he was, and he would just literally go so fast and there's no roads. It's just like dirt. And he would just yeah. make his own way. And um, it, it, was, it was pretty incredible. That's amazing. So where did you go after Mongolia? So that was my last, my last wild trip. Um, okay. That was in the fall. And I had more on the agenda coming up now, but I, you know, that's not happening right now. Mm -hmm. Um. But I did go um, also to some other interesting places. Um, a lot of people have heard of Chicateague because of the book Missy of Chicateague that a lot of um, kids read, you know, when they're little. Yeah. Um, and where Assateague, is that for people that so, don't know? Yeah, Assateague is in Maryland, um, and Chicateague is literally in, it's in in uh, Virginia, and they're connected. But there's like a, just a fence between them. But you have to drive around or take a boat around um, to get to Chicateague. So we went there and it was the first morning was so foggy that mm -hmm. I thought, oh, no, we're not going to be able to see one horse here. And if you have that image, um, which see. one? It's uh, running through the fog. Um, wild horses running in the fog. Hold on, I can bring it up here. Here it is. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, yeah. um, they came through the fog. That's on the site, you guys, kipton.com forward slash shop. Yeah. It's actually on my screen, it doesn't look as much. It's a little more peachy and orangey and just really beautiful. And they each have a trail they've left, you know, imprinted in the sand. Wow. And so the five of them each have their own little path. How do you get and shots when, when the horses are running toward you? That's one oh, of the questions. Okay, so I've had some close calls with that. Unfortunately, I... You're not supposed to really move when I've had um, in the Camargue in France, I had, you know, a big group of them all running right at me and I'm wearing waders and kneeling in the water. Um, and, mm -hmm. they, and I know you're not supposed to move or get up, but you see five of them coming literally straight at you. And what is your reaction? I, I was it's like, to, I, I got to get up and get I got to get out of the way. So on, at this one situation, I had kind of a face off and I'm kind of like going back and forth thinking, Oh my God, who's going to win this one? And I got out of the way and, and it was fine. But did um, they try to like trample you? Did they no, go? They don't no? mean, but I moved. If I would have just stayed put, they would have gone around me. Yeah. Oh my God. That's yeah. frightening. So I just sometimes I'm not, you know, I've just got to be a little more careful in those situations, you know, when they're. That's a side of you I didn't know. I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> we haven't talked about that. It takes a lot of guts. You're very yeah. brave, Julie. Well, I don't know how brave I am. But <laughs> you are. <laughs> but it was pretty exciting and, you know, I <laughs> kind of took my breath away. Where so, where next? So um, on the site, we have Wild biggest... in the Waves next to those white horses. Are oh, those yes. the okay. so that's Camargue another... horses? And those are just so magnificent that, uh, you know, that I have more on your side of those than I do some of the other places because they are just so incredible going through mm -hmm. the water and through the sand dunes. And um, I had someone really wonderful that was named Serge that helped me, you know, kind of know where they might travel to and where they might be and, you know, when they might come through a path. And I got so lucky with that through the dusty path. Um, mm -hmm. But they at their feet and that image. Was it's just magical, amazing. that photo. What time of the day was that very, shot? Very early in the morning. And it was um, so gorgeous. Literally, the next second, a split second later, they like you couldn't have gotten a good shot because they were so crowded together and they were run going down a dirt road then. So it was just right. that one moment when they came through this opening in the woods, and they stopped for one split second with the pink dust at their feet, and then phew, they were like down the road, and they <sighs> came back down the road again. But it, that spot was, you know like just an absolute split second moment that was so beautiful. What about the, the wild and the waves? That one where they're running out of the ocean. Are they in the ocean or are they on the shore? Or yeah, they were in the ocean, in and out of the ocean. Um, and they also had traveled from a marsh over to the ocean first. And I mm -hmm. was fortunate enough um, with Serge to get this. He is, has a phenomenal drone. 
Um, and I, he and I did it together. He did the harder work, but um, mm -hmm. we did the drone shots and I have these aerials of the white horses going towards the sea. And it, it, it's so cool. And then once they got to the sea, you know, they were splashing and, you know, just magnificent in the water. It's, we have another question. Are the wave shots in Chitok? I can't pronounce that. No, the wave, shots, um, the wave shots, I don't have the Chicoteague pictures in here. Um, that was in France, in the Camargue. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, Chicoteague, I have some images, but they weren't, they're not up. Um, and there was a lot of, um, in Chicoteague, it was really cool because a lot of babies were being born. So I have some pretty cool images of, um, of those. Let me just see if I can find them. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not going to try to look through my computer now and find them, but. Well, there's some others like the, how you captured like the white back photo of, it looks like it's almost photoshopped in a, <laughs> with a, you know, in a studio or something. It, it, and that was outside. Was that at night? No, that, that was photo? outside and it wasn't. But what I did was um, there was grasses behind the back. Um, and I was able to just darken, you know, the background more so that it was. Um, okay. okay. I'm hoping I don't lose you here, but I should show you. I have actually a giant one of that. And it is so spectacular in this. I side. love that. Yes. Yeah, I love that photo so much. It's striking. Okay, here it is. Oh, I can't show you my room because it's so messy here. Oh. Are you looking at it? Or am I? Oh, I'm pointing the wrong way. Am I? Okay. Here, there. let's see. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, wow, Julie. And it's that's incredible. In hold it. Frame. Hold the camera. Yeah, the Wi Fi is a little spotty there. Hold it oh, still okay. a little bit. Okay. Mm. All right. So we're yeah, back. Yeah, hold it still a little. But okay, we'll give people an idea. Yeah, that's beautiful. What? Uh -huh. um, talk about like different aspects of these horses. Like, are, are you more more attached to certain like the Camargue horses, or have you become um, more emotionally attached horse, to some? My favorite horses. I didn't talk about Iceland yet, or the Icelandics, and that's what we have. They are absolutely the most wonderful horses in the world. They, um, there's no predators in Iceland and they're very gentle and very just engaging and they yes. have, um, they're smaller. So I don't know when you get on, you don't feel like you're, you're going to fall as far. If you didn't you take me riding on ice? Didn't we ride on ice, the little I, Icelandic horses? I think you did. Alex. I think we did. I think that was with you. Yeah. Way like many years ago. Yeah. And they, yeah, they trot. They're like well, little, they told, yeah, they told, so they're so cute. They, <laughs> they do and um yeah they're just absolutely Hi, Javier. they're yeah. one of the oldest breeds in the world and when i went to iceland i had about 10 days uh, in a bed and breakfast um with helga her name was and she was helpful with me to tell me when i stayed by myself in this little farmhouse she would let me know when like a herd was was going through um and mm -hmm. going to the lakes and through the water and I got this amazing um, Palomino stallion there, and I'm right. going to show you that in Iceland because that is just. Do we, do we have some Iceland photos on the site? Oh, uh -huh. That's stunning. That one. What kind stunning. of horse is that? That's the well, Icelandic. That's like one of the Icelandics. Yeah, it was a stallion that was there, and I got to spend a lot of time with that stallion. So that was just really incredible. <sighs> so gorgeous. Uh oh, I made myself oh. double. How did I do that? You're double. I don't know. <laughs> I like oh, it. No, I don't like <laughs> it. How do I get out of that? Um, I push one stupid button. I I think it's next to oh, right. where the little happy face is. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. There you go. It's bad enough. It's all good. I only take pictures of other people and not myself. This is your this is your first Instagram live, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. And I'm blushing so much. I see how pink I am. It's like I'm, I shouldn't have been wearing a You pink look great. Shirt. You look great. So do we have any of the Icelandic horses on the site? I can't remember. I'm just looking to see. Uh... So we have the stallion in the grasses. Where was that one shot? That was in France. Yeah, so okay. I don't think we have any Icelandic ones up there. I was going to, and that's why I'm a little surprised. But doing eight, do you know how hard that was to pick eight? I know. 
I know we can put we can put up more if you guys want to see more let us know and we'll put more up there yeah um that was so hard what is do you have different stuff that I've been doing you know so um, do you want to what what's the question about the full we have a question mark on the full I know or a, is that the what's lost the, on island what's that maybe she's talking about the full that's lost on Sable Island oh yeah you want to talk about that a little bit more um well, yeah. Um, well, I don't really, there's not really that much more I can think about because it found its mom. And I do have an image of that too, which is so beautiful because the mom is looking down at the foal. Yeah. And I just basically, when you wander around in, in uh, Sable Island, you can walk for like an hour and you're hot and exhausted and you can't, you know, you don't have no idea where to find them. And then all of a sudden you walk over a hill and all of a sudden there's, Eight of them standing there by mm -hmm. a water hole drinking. So do that's you wanna, on some of these. Where do you want to go when you can travel again? Where are some of the locations? Okay, so I, I have gone out west um, Tony with Tony again, Tony Stromberg. And Santa Fe was magnificent, too. That was, But they weren't wild horses, but they're still, it was just fantastic. It was on a ranch where True Grit and um, uh, Lone Ranger were filmed. Okay. And really really cool very west i have a lot of really western shots from there um but then i would like to go do the mustangs and i have not gotten to do the mustangs yet and that will be okay. probably in montana or wyoming i also have covered some of the east coast but i want to go to corolla and shackleford in the Carolinas. now let's talk about we didn't talk about the rush and the camargue photo where the the horses are like charging you yeah. How close are you to to them when you got that shot? <laughs> Pretty close, actually. I, ha I have this long lens, but it's still, you know, it, as long as you're standing a little bit off to the side, um, they really don't want to, they don't want to run you down. They're, they're going to go past you. Mm -hmm. And at the they're end not of like the Buffalo where they're just going to like trample you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, is at the end, I turned and looked um, one of the days and I thought, oh, okay, I'm all done shooting. They're all gone now. They're all, they've all taken off. And then all of a sudden I look in the distance and I see this beautiful long line of all of the horses just going off to another area. And it was just, mm -hmm. cool. yeah. um, and a lot of times too, they come out like completely muddy because they're going through a marsh and um, right. they're not always looking bright and shiny and white like they did in the water. If you had to pick one, one shot, that's the, kind of the most memorable or mo most emotional, which shot would it be um, of the eight that we have on the site? Oh, of the eight. Um, I think that lost on Sable Island. And I, I had somebody, a client buy that, and they told me a story that they bought it because they had adopted a little girl who had been abandoned um, mm. in the, something. She was like 10 years old and I, they had just adopted her and they bought that for her bedroom. And it was, yeah, it was touching. Really touching. That's sweet. Um, I also, I just wanted to say, um, I was just going to show you very, do I still have time room? Yeah. Time? yeah. Okay. The, my oldest stuff was more of the Polaroid stuff. And this was a mixture of encaustic paints and um, mm, beautiful, an old, Julie. You know, a Polaroid. And then here's another one I did in Iceland that I really had fun with because I used the encaustics again. And it's one lone horse at the very, well, it's hard to see in this lighting. At the very so, end down here. We have another question. Are you shooting both digitally and with film on your trips? So I had trouble giving up film because I love the darkroom so much, but I finally um, now I'm really just doing digital. Um, yeah, so I'm just doing digital, but I've always loved printing so much. So I have a beautiful, I've always- You have an archive, incredible archive too. Yeah, and so I, well, with the printing, I've tried um, a lot of different things over the years, and I had a really great dark room. And then when I gave that up, I got a big, huge, um, giant printer, which I've been, I would use for about 20 years. And now I replace that with an even nicer one, and I can print on silk and canvas. And this one's on canvas, I was just showing you. Um, oh, amazing. Show. Show us again. Let's see. Okay. That was just printed recently? Yeah. Oh, that's gorgeous. And then it's painted into, so it really is a painting. You know, it's much more oh, of a, that's nice. than a photograph. So Very that nice. one was fun. Um, 
Oh, I, I, you know what I should have talked a little bit more about is, you know, I was trying to explain that it's not really just about what cameras you're using and the equipment, mm -hmm. but really about lighting. And the lighting is like almost as important as anything. And like I said, early morning, late in the day is the best. Mm -hmm. And also I used to always think the light has to land on the subject and that's like the perfect shot. But often yeah. too, you know, doing the silhouette like I did on Sable Island of that black and white one I showed you on top of the cliff. Mm -hmm. this, one, this one's from Iceland. Ooh, turn the, put the, point the camera down a little bit. Okay. We didn't see it all. Okay, hold on. Sorry. I should just switch it around. Okay. There we go. Oh, yeah, there you go. <gasps> Ooh, that's pretty. Really and that's pretty. in Iceland, and that is so beautiful because it's backlit. Oh, nice. And, you know, I just, um, I've tried what to. What time of day? Myself. What time that of day was, was that? the end of the day. Okay. The day. Okay. Yep. Oh, I was going to talk a little bit about Sable Island, the winds there too. That's what blows like the grasses and the, uh, what kind of, and what kind of horses are those? So they, they probably, they have different stories about how they got there, but they're, um, you know, just, they're smaller and stockier than, um, sorry, didn't turn that around fast enough. Stockier okay. than a lot of horses and a little bit smaller. And they think mm -hmm. they came, I think from, you know, from Spain originally, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember now with Sable Island, because let's see. Um, I'll have to get to back to you on that one. Somebody said, um, I'm gonna make people, sure we're getting. Well, people used to say that all the questions. They maybe came off. Um, there's it's the graveyard of the Atlantic, so how many shipwrecks? Mm -hmm. um, there's 350 shipwrecks there on Sable Island. But I think they actually used the horses. Um, they had lighthouses there um, to help ships going past. So I think that's when the mm -hmm. horses were used on Sable Island. I'm going to have to look it up again to remember all the details. Somebody said, yes, Wyoming. They want you to go to Wyoming to shoot. Or about, she lives in Jackson Hole. <laughs> oh, OK. She, she used to ride our Icelandic. She used to live in New York City. And, yeah. Um, she, yeah, she used to ride. Um, I've got great pictures. Awesome. So, so since you, so back to, to your story a little bit, I, I, you know, since you can't really ride, you've kind of retired from riding, right? Yes, unfortunately. So um, do you, what else do you do? Or, I mean, besides like capturing these amazing wild horses, is there another aspect that you want to, you know, focus on in future series that you're doing? And different parts of the, like the heads or the manes or anything else in particular? What I'd like to do is I'd like to do a book. Um, and also I'd like to teach more. I used to teach, um, mm -hmm. I used to teach workshops. I still am doing some workshops, but I taught, um, actually I was a TA at the university of Wisconsin and I taught, um, there. And then I've taught, um, I taught one year of elementary school when I first finished college too. So mm -hmm. I really love, um, sharing stories and teaching. So I'm thinking about, Beautiful. Do um, workshops that would kind of be slideshows and and tell more about the wild horses in these different locations and how they survive and what they eat and um, how they live. And in Sable Island, you're not allowed to touch them. And they do take samples of their DNA when they die to try to understand what caused the death. Um, so are there but, people that, that take care of them on Sable Island? No. At There's all? some researchers there that are primarily there for the seals and for the – it's the biggest – amount of gray seals I think anywhere in the world and they're literally covering all the beaches um, and they're there studying climate and um, you know they, some they do do research on the horses um, but mm -hmm. there was I think four that are always there and they rotate like they'll stay there for like three months and they live in a little you know a little house and but that's in oh, yeah. on Sable Island there's you know there's no population incredible well, you guys on the this the prices of the photos are on the site, um, and these are additions. So, the twenty by thirties are are additions of fifty. Um, well, in some cases they are, but the Mongolian pair that's an addition of twenty five, and those come in twenty by thirties, but they also come in larger sizes. So we didn't oh, wait, um, wait, wait. list the larger sizes on there. The twenty by thirties come in additions of fifty. So I don't know if it says that on there or not. or if, if It needs to be fixed. Okay. Okay. We'll fix Sorry about that. And then the yep. big 
one that ones that come in editions of 25, the 40 by 60s or the 30 by. Mm -hmm. 30. So there's okay. the, the two sizes. I think you primarily have the smaller size on there, but um, they also come in the giant um, big piece. And a lot well, of them, I did want to say another thing that um, I, yeah. I get very involved in the process too. And I, you know, I wouldn't be in this situation because they're buying prints, but a lot of times I suggest you frame them in, um, depends on your home, obviously, but I do um, barn wood um, and I stain like the barn wood to go. With oh the yeah, the distressed wood, um, it's beautiful. Yeah, the distressed wood or this one here, this is a close up of an eye and that's like Dude, in a white Where was bottle. that one shot? So that was also in the Camargue. Mm, beautiful, it's Thank emotional you. with the eyes. Yeah, I love well, the eyes. The Julie, eyes yeah, no, you. it's so beautiful what you're doing. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, with me and with having the conversation today. Um, thank you everybody for joining. And um, I'll archive the call on the IGTV and then you'll be able to watch it, then rewatch it and share it with uh, with people that love horses or, or uh, shots of nature. So um, Julie, let's do this again. I'd let's love do this again another time. Sorry, I jumped around so much like turning my phone in so many directions. No, don't apologize. It's all good. I probably made it's everybody dizzy. <laughs> no, it's all good. We your your work is really beautiful. Love seeing the cameras and hearing the stories, and we could continue the conversation. And maybe we'll uh, we'll do another one. Um, maybe we'll do another one soon and and talk about other uh, other series that you've done outside of the horses. So perfect. Oh, thank you so okay. much. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Right. Thanks, You're welcome. Thank you. Especially. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for joining. Bye, Julia. Talk to you soon.